and we'll start recording. All right, my name is Glenn Berry, and I work for SQLSkills.com as a principal consultant. And we'll be talking about analyzing IO subsystem performance today. So what we're going to talk about is, well, there's a little bit of advertising about us. We've got a team of six people who work for SQL Skills. The important thing here is my email address and my Twitter handle. If you've got any questions that come up that I don't answer, make sure to either talk to me on Twitter or send me an email. All right, and then there's my email right there. And I like to make beer, so that's my brewing setup at home. So last thing I want to talk about here is just the overview. We're going to talk about the three main metrics for storage performance that you typically like to look at. And then talk about some SQL Server specific IO workload metrics that are very useful. And talk about some tools you can use to test your storage subsystems. And talk a little bit about the primary storage types that are typically used with SQL Server and talk a little bit about RAID levels and SQL Server workloads and show some comparative storage metrics. So we've got a lot to cover in just a short amount of time here. So the three main metrics for storage performance that you typically look at are latency, which is usually measured in milliseconds and sometimes better, input-output operations per second or IOPS, and then sequential throughput and either megabytes per second or gigabytes per second with a good system. And these measurements are all related so you can't just look at one of them without knowing what's going on with the other ones. And you need to be aware that the storage vendors tend to show off whichever one of those three makes their system look the best. And especially for SQL Server, that can be a big issue. So latency is just the time that it takes for an IO to complete. And sometimes it's called response time or service time, depending on the tool or the vendor. And it starts when the LS sends a request to the drive and ends when the drive says that it's done with the request. And sometimes your writes are actually still in a cache somewhere in the system, depending on what kind of storage you're dealing with. And then you've got input output operations per second or IOPS. And this is related to latency. If you've got a constant latency of one millisecond, that means you can do a thousand IOs per second with a Q depth of one, which is not really a typical server kind of a workload. And as you add more and more concurrent IOs, your latency tends to increase. Not so much with flash storage, though, compared to magnetic storage. And IOPS is just the key depth divided by the latency. And it doesn't tell you what the transfer size is, whether it's a 4K, like a lot of benchmark tools use, or an 8K transfer like SQL Server uses for a lot of different things. And you can translate between IOPS and megabytes per second and megabytes per second to latency as long as you know the Q depth or and or the transfer size. And so then we have sequential throughput. And this is really important to SQL Server people. And it's quite often for a lot of systems measured in megabytes per second. But if you've got really good sequential throughput, it's gigabytes per second. And you can see with the same number of IOPS here, if you have a 4K transfer size versus an 8K transfer size, your sequential throughput you know, is double with the 8K transfer size. And a lot of times, enterprise storage sort of short changes sequential throughput because a lot of times you've got some sort of bandwidth limitation somewhere along the storage chain. So an old worst case scenario would have been one gigabit per second iSCSI NICs talking to an iSCSI SAN. If you had something like that, you're gonna be limited to around 100 megabytes per second, which is really pretty pathetic. Thankfully, we don't see that kind of stuff as often anymore, but just knowing that sort of limitation can be a big deal for a lot of SQL Server systems. You also have an occasion where sometimes your disks and whatever system you're talking to, whether it's a SAN or direct attached storage, are just so busy that they just can't deliver their rated throughput for sequential operations. And so the importance of sequential throughput for us DBAs, things that you do all the time on a daily basis, like full database backups and hopefully restores, initializing AG replicas, mirrors, replication subscribers, log shipping secondary copies, that all relies on your sequential throughput performance. Another really big one is index creation and index rebuilds. You know, if you've got really good sequential throughput, you're going to be a lot more likely to do effective index tuning, which is one of your best weapons as a DBA. If you know it's going to take you hours to build an index on a large table, you're much less likely to try doing index tuning, whether compared to 
you can do it in five or 10 minutes, for example. And then if you've got a, a big data warehouse or reporting type workload that does big, large sequential scans, your sequential read throughput is very important for your query performance. All right, so important SQL Server IO workload metrics. You wanna understand what is the read versus write ratio of your workload. And you can use my DMV diagnostic queries. You can just query uh, Bing, uh, Glenn Berry DMV and find them. And they will tell you at the file level and at the disk level, what's the read versus write ratio of your workload. And that helps you understand your storage workload and design and tune a better storage subsystem. And these ratios are gonna be different for your different SQL Server file types and different workloads. And they're gonna be different at different times of the day, depending on what you're doing. You also want to understand what are your typical I.O. rates in terms of IOPS and throughput. So you can look at Perfmon and get reads per second and writes per second, which is IOPS at the disk level, the logical disk level. And then you can get read bytes per second and disk writes per second, writes in Perfmon, and that's your throughput, again, at the disk level, which is quite often not that useful, but that's the first thing you want to look at. And then you can drill a little bit deeper and figure out what your average logical disk level latency is at the disk level from a DMV query. And then you can drill into the file level. So for your individual database files, each one of your data files and your log file for all your different databases, you can see what's been going on with that and have, start to understand how your system is performing currently. So here's some methods for measuring your IO performance. You can look at the disk section in Windows Resource Monitor, and with some kinds of storage, you can see what's going on there in real time, and you can sort the different columns. So sometimes I will watch that when I'm doing something like building an index or running a backup, just to sort of understand what's happening with the different logical drives and the different files and, what, and what's going on there. And then also, again, you've got the logical disk counters in Perfmon, and then you can also use some benchmark tools to measure things before you go on production, like Crystal Dismark for a quick and dirty easy test, and then Microsoft Disk Speed to do more detailed testing. And Disk Speed is used under the covers by Dismark, but you don't have as much control as you do with the command line or PowerShell running Disk Speed natively. So here's what Windows Resource Monitor would look like, and you can sort the columns here and see what your latency is for reads and writes. And you can see how hard it's working for reads and writes and get a quick and dirty idea of how your IO system is working in real time. And then here's the most important, in my opinion, logical discounters in Perfmon. And of course, this only gives you a disk level view, not a file level view, unfortunately. And then Next thing I'm gonna do is jump out and run a few storage related queries to see what's going on with SQL Server from an IO perspective. So if we go here, the first thing I wanna do, sometimes when I start talking about using Crystal Disk Mark or Microsoft Disk Speed, you'll get pushback from your storage admin who says, well, that's just a synthetic benchmark. That's not what SQL Server does. So this query right here, which I'm gonna you know, give to David to upload, is a quick and dirty query you can run on a system to see what it can do from a sequential throughput point of view. So what we're going to do is run a checkpoint and, and drop clean buffers, which you don't want to do that on a production system, and then turn on statistics IO and statistics time. And then I've got a, a big database with about a 17 gigabyte table on my laptop here. So we'll do that first. And then we're going to go ahead and run a query right here. And this is the trick. Just use this index hint, index zero to force it to read the clustered index or do a table scan if there is no clustered index. And when we do that, since I did a drop clean buffers, we're reading from the storage subsystem. Anything that might've been in the buffer pool was gone. So however long it takes to do this, which is about 11 seconds on my laptop, we can go to the messages tab and get the IO statistics for read ahead reads and physical reads and we also get the elapsed time from statistics time. So we go and grab those numbers and we can plug them into this little equation right down here. So this is eight kilobytes per page. And then here's how many physical reads and read ahead reads we had divided by the elapsed time in milliseconds. And if you let SQL Server do the calculation, this shows you that we're getting about 1626 megabytes per second, 
of sequential throughput from my laptop, which is going to be a lot better than many people have on their production SQL server. But you can run this on your system during a maintenance window, for example, to say, okay, right there is what SQL Server can do reading from my data files. So another you can do if you have time is you can run the same thing without flushing the buffer pool and set max stop to one and two and three to, to calculate how quickly your cores and your processor can process the data. So that's another interesting thing to see whether or not you have a balanced system. And this ties into some of the work that Microsoft did with the Fast Track Data Warehouse, where you can build a system that's balanced between its storage and its memory and its processor capacity to consume the data coming in as quickly as possible. So anyways, next I'm going to switch over to a subset of my DMV queries that focus on some storage related items. So we're going to run through this fairly quickly. First thing I want to do is understand, okay, what build and addition of SQL Server am I on? So I'm on SQL Server 2017 RTM. I'm on Enterprise Edition. I want to know, actually Developer Edition, but I want to know if I'm on Developer or Standard Edition because Enterprise Edition and Developer Edition, which are the same except for licensing, they actually perform much better for I.O. than Standard Edition does. They do things like more aggressive read-ahead reads. So I want to know that. Plus, am I on a really old build or not? Then I want to find out what's going on with my any global trace flags. And with SQL Server 2016 and 2017, you don't need a lot of the old trace flags that you used to need in the past. But I still like to use 3226, which just disables writing successful uh, database backup messages to the SQL Server error log. But on earlier versions of SQL Server, there's other trace flags that actually can affect performance that you want to make sure to have enabled. Next, I've got I want to know, okay, what at a basic level, what's going on with my hardware and memory? So I just understand that. And so this is the 2017 version. And this is going to show me I've got one socket, one NUMA node. I've got 32 gigs of RAM. I've got four cores for socket. And some of these columns here are new for 2017. And I've got eight logical CPUs. And I've got 32 gigs of RAM. And I can also come over here and find out when SQL Server last started and whether I'm not using auto soft NUMA, whether I have lock pages and memory enabled, which I don't on my laptop right there. And if you see a hypervisor here, that doesn't mean you're running inside of a hypervisor. You might be. It just means there's a hypervisor present on the host. And in my case, I'm running natively outside of the hypervisor for this instance. So don't let that confuse you. All right, the next thing we want to look at is, do I have instant file initialization enabled? And if I run this on new enough version of SQL Server, it'll tell me, yes, I do have it enabled, and that lets it skip the step of zeroing out a data file when you create a database or grow a data file or restore from the backup. All right, the next thing I want to know is what's going on with my licensing, and what does SQL Server actually see and using? And in my case, I've got one socket with four cores for socket and eight logical, and it's using all eight. But where this bites a lot of people is with VMs. So if they're using SQL Server Standard Edition and they create a VM that has more than four NUMA nodes, it won't use them because of the license restriction. And if you use more than 24 cores, it also won't use them. And so it bites you with VMs and also with physical machines because of the core count. And this will uncover if you've got an issue with that. All right, the next thing is what kind of processor do I have? And you might be thinking, well, who cares what kind of processor you have? Well, this has a direct effect on what level of PCIe support you have. And also, it indirectly affects how fast the rest of the system is and how fast I can consume the data coming in from the storage subsystem. So I've got a pretty screaming little Xeon E3 V6 on my laptop. But you can Google this and find out all the specifications and figure out whether or not it supports PCIe version 3, for example. And that's something you want to know. Next, I want to look at just a few configuration uh, values for my instance. And these are, these are ones that I think are pretty important. And SQL Server 2016 and newer has this one, which comes into play if you have more than eight uh, physical cores in a NUMA node. And then backup checksum default and backup compression default, both should be turned on in most cases, especially in 2016 and newer. You might want to raise cost threshold of parallelism to a higher value depending on your workload. Five is usually too low. 
Max degree of parallelism might need to be adjusted depending on your workload and your hardware. Max server memory needs to be an appropriate value depending on your hardware and your workload. And then optimize for ad hoc workloads, I think should always be turned on. So those are the ones I wanna focus on from an IO perspective. The next one is, I wanna see is buffer pool extension enabled or not? And in my case, it's not, but there's a new feature they added in 2014 to let you set aside some space in your storage subsystem for to cache clean buffer pool pages. And where this can help you, mainly it's useful if you have standard edition and if your storage is uh, magnetic with very poor random read, uh, write, uh, random read IO performance. And if that's the case, if you can set aside a cache file on fast local flash storage, you might see a performance improvement with this. And you also need to have an OLTP kind of a workload. It purposely doesn't work very well for data warehouse kinds of workloads. So if that scenario is your case, you might be able to get some performance very cheaply by trying out this feature. And if you did have it turned on, we could run the next query, which I'm gonna skip since I don't have it turned on to see which of your databases were actually using that buffer pool file. All right, the next one I wanna run is I've got, I wanna understand how my databases are laid out across my file system. On my laptop, I just have a, a really fast C drive so they're laid out here across a C drive, but on a real database server, you're gonna have different drive letters and understanding how many databases you have and how the files are laid out and how many tempdb data files you have is all useful information. All right, the next one in this little set, we're almost done here, is volume information for all of our LUNs that have any SQL Server database file. So I've got a terabyte drive here and I've got quite a bit of free space which is important for SQL Server for the obvious reason, but also as you get low on space, even magnetic storage loses performance and flash storage loses performance as you get low on storage for different reasons. So getting low on storage is a bad thing and this will help clue you into the fact that, oh yeah, I'm getting a little low on space on my R drive, for example. All right, this next one is looking for those infamous 15 second IO warnings that you sometimes see in your SQL Server error log. And thankfully I don't have any here, but if I did, I'd wanna look and see, is there any kind of a pattern? Is it always happening at 3 a.m. when I'm rebuilding my indexes or running DBCC check DB? Is it always on the same drives and the same files? Or is it just sort of random, all different times of the day, or no apparent pattern? Because if that's the case, that's really strong evidence that your IO subsystem is just having general performance issues instead of just being caused by one specific thing you might be doing to really stress it. All right, the next one is a query I sort of stole from Jimmy May that shows you your latency across all of your drives that you have SQL Server database files. And this particular query is a little deceptive because it picks up everything that's touched all the SQL Server database files on there since you've been running. And so not just your regular workload, but other things like index maintenance and HADR operations and anything you might have done to touch those files. So these numbers you see here will be higher than you'll see in a lot of other tools. But still, if I see high numbers here, I'm gonna look more closely what's going on on that drive. So this is at the drive level. And then the next one is gonna drill into a file level. We saw the C drive had fairly high read latency. And if we look here, this database right here is the main culprit. It's seeing pretty high latency on its data file. And you can see it's a 41 gigabyte file. And you can also see some inter interesting stuff about it, such as the number of reads and the number of writes. And this helps you start to understand, you know, from looking here, lots and lots of reads and no writes. That's a very read heavy workload on that particular file, for example. All right, the next thing I wanna look at that's related to IO is what are my VLF counts? And there's actually a new query for 2017 that I didn't put in here that makes this an easier query, but VLFs are virtual log files that are inside of your log file. And every time your log file grows, you add more VLFs. And if you have hundreds of thousands of VLFs, the write performance to your log file tends to deteriorate. And then a, a worse issue is that crash recovery takes longer. So whenever you start SQL Server, and also whenever you restore from a full 
database back up. It takes much longer if you have a high VLF count. So being aware of that and controlling it is really important. The next thing I want to understand, which one of my databases is using the most I.O.? So when I run this query, this shows me, okay, this guy is using almost all the I.O., this no compression test database. So that's nice to know instead of just guessing. And then this is the infamous top weight stats query. And the reason I call it infamous is that a lot of people will run this query and just lose their minds. So they'll run this and they'll see CX packet weights. And then they go Google CX packet weights and they find somebody telling them, oh, you should change max stop to one because you have high CX packet weights. And that's really bad advice. And so the point here is this is more useful when you're under stress and you're not running very well. And then you want to go to somebody you respect to find out, okay, what does this really mean? And what, if anything, should I do about it? And the best place to go is to Paul Randall's weight types library where he documents almost all of the weight types and, and the list is growing all the time and tells you what it means and what if anything you might want to do if you see that top weight type but just don't make the mistake of running this query and then immediately start changing things without doing more research and analysis all right the next thing i want to run is get all my average task counts and i want to run this multiple times on a production system and if i see high average task counts, that usually means either my systems are very busy or I'm seeing lots of blocking and deadlocking. If I see a high runnable task count above zero, that means I have runnable tasks or waiting for CPU time, it's sort of a secondary indicator of CPU pressure. And then this one's sort of obvious, and this is average across all my CPU schedulers. So I see this above zero, that's a good indicator that I'm waiting for tasks to finish their uh, I.O. work. All right, the next one I always like to look at is page life expectancy. And this is a measurement of internal memory pressure. And this is per Newman mode. And you can see it's going up as I'm talking, which is what you would expect. And you wanna watch this over time and see what the trends are and what your high and low is. And always having more, you know, a higher value here is a good thing. If, you know, if you're seeing very low numbers on a sustained basis, that means you're under internal memory pressure and that puts more pressure on your storage subsystem. So either doing some workload tuning or adding more memory to the machine can help this and really take a lot of the stress off your storage subsystem. And then we'll open this final query in the set. We want to make sure we switch to the database that we care about. And then this will show us our IO statistics for each file in the current database. And we've got just the data file and the log file. And now you can see the number of reads and the number of writes. And you can also see it broken out percentage wise and megabytes wise. And so this helps you understand this looks like a reporting workload from what I'm seeing. And that's gonna have an effect on what RAID level you choose and what kind of storage you choose and how you configure things like caches. So instead of guessing, if you have an existing workload, you can actually look at this stuff and know what you're really doing. All right. So let's jump back out to the PowerPoint and talk about what all these numbers mean. All right, great, hit the wrong button. So what we got here is we got this far. All right, so what you typically see after you do that is it's very common to see high write latency to your temp DB data files. I see that a lot when we run these queries. So if that's the case, if you're actually using temp DB a lot, it makes a lot of sense in many cases to make sure you're using local flash-based storage for temp DB. But don't just assume you need that. A lot of workloads don't use temp DB that much, and maybe that's not the best place for your flash. And then you want to have multiple data files, not because it really is an I.O. bottleneck, but it's a contention bottleneck with some workloads. And SQL Server 2016 and newer takes care of this for you during setup. But if you have an older version, you might have to make some changes here. And then you want to make sure you have trace flag 1118 turned on and unless you're on SQL Server 2016. And then it's also very common to see high read latency from your user database data files. And if I see that, I'm going to look for signs of memory pressure like low PLE and or memory grants pending, high memory grants pending. And then I might just add more RAM, you know, and people might laugh at you. Well, you're just throwing hardware at the problem. That's one thing you could do. 
Or you can do your job as a DBA and do some workload and index tuning to reduce your memory pressure and reduce your storage pressure at the same time as a secondary benefit. And then if you have SQL Server 2014 or newer, especially standard edition, buffer pool extension might help you with certain workloads. So you can give it a try. It's not very expensive to try. It doesn't require expensive, redundant enterprise storage. You can try it out with even a consumer drive just to see if it seems to help. Because you don't lose anything if you lose that cache file. All right, Crystal Dismark is a, a free benchmark tool you can download. It comes from a Japanese website that scares some DBAs because there's little flashing ads and stuff, but the software is perfectly safe and it's been around for years. And you can do some initial quick testing of each one of your logical drives. It doesn't work with mount points without a lot of jumping through hoops. And what I always want to do is test each one of my logical drives before I even install SQL Server. It only takes a few minutes. And you want to make sure you test with a large test file size. Don't just use the one gigabyte default. And you also want to test with random and non-random test file types in case you're doing either software or hardware compression anywhere in your system. And then let it run through five test runs. And so here's what it looks like, the graphical results. And the two most relevant uh, rows here are right here, the first row and then the second row. And this, the first row is your sequential throughput with a QDEP of 32 for reads and writes. And then the second row is your random uh, throughput with a QDEP of 32. And if you were to hover over this, it would show you the IOPS, but there's a better way to get that, which is the next screen. You can do control C and get all the text results and stick this into a notepad file or an email or whatever to see all the gory details behind this. And also, it's important that you type in what you're testing down here in this text box because Crystal Dismark doesn't know anything about it. It just knows the logical drive. So type in what you're testing so you have that with all your test results. So that's what that looks like. And we can jump out here. And I'm not actually going to run this test. I ran them in advance. But I just want to show you I've got a Samsung 960 Pro NVMe SSD here that has really amazing performance. It's probably one of the fastest things you can buy right now for a laptop or a desktop system. And so you can see this is 3,294 megabytes per second for reads and 2060 for writes. Usually the writes are not as good with flash storage as with reads. And then here, if you hover over this, you get a tooltip that shows you the IOPS for reads and writes. So you can see that and then compare that to I've got a Samsung 850 Evo in an external enclosure plug into a USB 3 port over here actually is that one. So that's what you see here. And then I've got something else, two of these in RAID 0 plugged into a USB 3.1. So you can see pretty decent. And I, I run VMs off of that. So you know you see a wide range of results from here. I know it takes a few minutes to run this. And this is pretty pathetic. This is an SDXC card like you would have in a cell phone. It's in one of the slots on my laptop, and it's pretty bad here. It's worse than a magnetic hard drive for sequential throughput, and the IOPS are nothing to write home about either. So that's how that works. And then here's what the results look like in text format. And it's just really quick and easy to run this and save the results, and then you can compare that. And if you go on and make any storage changes, run it again and see what's happening. And of course, you can do crystal disk mark or you can do some dispute actually with a command line to get more detailed results, but that's a lot more time consuming. All right, Let's see if we do it right this time. So the primary storage types for SQL Server, you've got internal drives, direct attached storage, storage area networks, PCIe flash based add-in storage cards, and then SMB file shares. Those are kind of the most common things that you see out there in the wild now. And internal drives, if you've got especially flash drives, you can have up to 28 two and a half inch drives in a typical two socket server. And that gives you a lot of capacity and drive performance that'll support a lot of different workloads. And this is very well suited for availability group node storage. So you don't have to use shared storage such as a SAN. You could have each node in your AG topology running on internal drives, for example, or direct attached storage. And the, the vertical form factor of a rack mount server kind of affects the number of drive bays. 
you want to try to favor two and a half inch drives instead of three and a half inch drives because they perform better in most cases and they use less power and it just lets you have more drives in the same form factor. And it's really important with internal drives and with direct attached storage to spring for the very best hardware RAID controller you can get for your server because you're going to have faster processors and larger cache and it's really important especially for parity based RAID levels you might decide to use to have a really good RAID controller if that's not something you want to skimp on. Direct attached storage is very similar except that it's in an external storage enclosure and in this case, you want to have at least one RAID controller attached to each storage enclosure. And some people will have two RAID controllers so they can have less drives on each RAID controller. And it's pretty easy to configure and manage direct attached storage. It doesn't require a cranky SAN administrator. And these can give you excellent sequential read-write performance. You're ultimately limited by your PCIe slot bandwidth or the number of lanes, PCIe lanes, that your CPU can support. So these are also very well suited for availability group node storage. And then with direct attached storage, again, one dedicated RAID controller per storage enclosure. You might even want two. Use the best RAID controller you can get. And for most SQL Server workloads, you want to try to use the hardware cache on the RAID controller for writes instead of reads. And make sure it's enabled. I can't tell you how many Dell systems that people put together using the Dell OMSA utility, where they had a nice hardware cache on their RAID controller, but it wasn't enabled, so they weren't even using it. And just turning it on made a big difference in the performance. And you want to make sure you understand what kind of PCIe slot you have your RAID controller in and whether or not it's going to be an issue for you. All right, here's what I keep mentioning PCIe. There's different generations of PCIe, and so a really old server might be stuck on PCIe generation one. In a worst case scenario, it's an X4 slot, which means four lanes. And that entire slot can only do 750 megabytes per second. So if you were to stick a really expensive add-in flash storage card in that slot, the slot would be artificially limiting your performance in a major way. And where you want to be is down here on gen three on an X8 slot, if, if possible. And most modern servers are going to have that as long as they have a new enough processor. And that's what goes into this next slide. If you want PCIe 3.0 support, which is the best you can get right now, soon we're going to have PCIe 4, but not yet, you need to have one of these processors. So the Xeon scalable processor family does it. The E5s have done it since the very first one all the way up to the V4. The E7 started doing it on V2, and now finally AMD supports this with the Epic 7000 series. So if you have any one of these, you're good to go. But if you have something older, you probably are on PCIe 2.0 or worse, and that's going to have a big effect on what that slot can do. All right, PCIe flash storage, which is flash-based storage on a PCIe expansion card. It looks like a video card to somebody. And it uses that high bandwidth PCIe slot that has less latency and more throughput than you're going to get from a SAS or SATA port. And the latest generations of these products are using non-volatile memory express, which is a new protocol that has much better performance for flash storage and much less CPU overhead on the host. And again, the type and the speed of that slot can be your limiting factor. And these cards give you extremely high IO performance. And they also use less electrical power than having dozens or hundreds of magnetic drives, which can save you a lot on electrical and cooling costs and rack space. And it's pretty common to use two of these cards and just use you know, a storage space RAID 1 for redundancy across the two cards. All right, storage area networks is a big, expensive, shared external storage enclosure that has lots of complicated components. And they give you a lot of nice capabilities like sand snapshots and thin provisioning, and they're pretty cool, but they have a lot of issues when it comes to SQL Server. And they also, also come with a cranky sand administrator for no extra charge. And there's two main types of sands, fiber channel and then iSCSI. And typically sands are optimized for IOPS. Sequential throughput can be their big uh, Achilles heel in a lot of cases. And that's kind of important to us SQL Server people. 
All right, SAN performance considerations. Make sure that you consider the complete data path to the SAN, your HBA, your NIC, your switches, any SAN ports, and just be prepared for inconsistent performance with a shared SAN. Sometimes it's going to be pretty good and sometimes not so good sometimes, and that can be very frustrating. And be aware that SANs are not magic. You know, the details of what's in the SAN, what kind of storage it is, and how it's configured, it still matters, even though the SAN vendor will tell you all this stuff about, oh, we've got this big cache and everything lives there and everything else underneath it doesn't matter. Well, it, it does. And so just, you know, you can probably tell I'm not a big SAN fan. So anyways, SAN administrator considerations. As a SQL Server DBA, you want to really make an effort to communicate with your SAN administrator and let them know what kind of workload you're going to be dealing with. SQL Server OLTP, that's very write heavy. And don't just say, well, I need five terabytes of space on the SAN. Try to tell them what kind of performance metrics you're trying, you're trying to get and what your SLA requirements are. And then be aware that they've got different priorities than you do. They've got multiple servers with different workloads sharing their SAN. And they've got to worry about running low on space in the SAN because if they do, they've got to go ask for a whole bunch more money to expand the SAN. And they've got to worry about people like me complaining about the performance. And they have to worry about the CIO complaining about how expensive it is. So you want to try to befriend them and work together as a team. All right, another thing you can do with SQL Server is use SMB file shares to store your SQL Server files. And you've been able to do this since SQL Server 2012. This doesn't mean stick it out on a file server and talk to your Broadcom integrated NIC on your database server. You know, you need special networking equipment to take advantage of this. And you want to make sure that whatever you're dealing with has SMB direct and supports RDMA, remote direct memory access, so that it's the right kind of networking hardware. And what you really want to do is something called storage spaces direct, if you're going to do something along this line, which is a new feature in Windows Server 2016. And Jose Barreto, who used to work on the storage team, has a lot of good blog posts about how to use SMB file shares with SQL Server. Another thing you want to find more about is Storage Spaces Direct, which is software-defined storage that lets you build or buy commodity servers and put them in a storage cluster that you can use for Hyper-V or SQL Server, very similar to how you would use a SAN. And it lets you build or buy these servers with different kinds of storage it's a lot less expensive than you might get from other uh, methods and you can use SAS or SATA drives you can use PCIe flash cards you can use M.2 cards and there's tiering involved and this is something that's much more popular with the Hyper-V people but I think it's going to become more popular in the next year or two with SQL Server as people understand how it works so I've got some references, just more information about Storage Spaces Direct, and it's just something you want to start learning more about, I think. All right, consider your workload for storage. You want to make understand you've got different kinds of workloads you might have to deal with. So OLTP, reporting against OLTP databases, relational data warehouse, uh, OLAP. These different kinds of sort of broad types of workloads have different storage demands. And they're going to have different I.O. access patterns in terms of the read-write ratio against the different file types, and whether you're doing sequential or random reads and writes. So understanding that is pretty important. And you've got the tools with all these different queries that I've shown you to start to understand this. And then with an OLTP workload, you're going to see frequent writes to your data files and to your log file. And if your data file and your active part of your data doesn't fit in the buffer pool, you're going to see frequent reads from the data files to refresh what's in the buffer pool. So random I.O. performance tends to be more important for OLTP workloads. And if you just have a single database log file on a LUN all by itself, you're getting sequential writes to it. Not too many people have that luxury. So if you've got multiple databases with all their log files on the same LUN, then the write activity is a lot more random and you might need to use flash storage because of that where you didn't actually need it for just a single one. So that's something to think about. If you've got a data warehouse or reporting kind of a workload, you're seeing big sequ sequential reads from your data files if it doesn't fit into memory. And of course, kind of a no-brainer there to help that is use SQL Server data compression 
or clustered column store indexes if you have a new enough version of SQL Server. And you're not going to use the log file very much on this kind of a workload except during data loads. So sequential read I.O. performance is very important. And you need to think about that as you select and configure your storage subsystem. Now, OAP tends to have random reads from your cube file. So random I.O. performance is very important there. And then sequential writes when you're building the cube files. So RAID levels and SQL Server workloads. This gets into thinking about what desired RAID level you want based on your SLA and being aware that RAID 10 and non-parity-based RAID levels like RAID 10 and RAID 1 are going to be much better for write-intensive workloads. And the different workloads we've talked about are going to be either more write-intensive or more read-intensive. And it may change at different times of the day depending what activity is going on there and what kind of files you're dealing with. And just be aware that RAID levels like RAID 10 and RAID 50 are a lot more robust than RAID 5 is, for example. So even though maybe your workload doesn't need RAID 10 for performance reasons, maybe you want to choose that for uh, redundancy reasons. All right, selecting a RAID level for your SLA. RAID's not a substitute for a good backup or store plan, no matter what anybody tries to tell you. I've had people try to bully me into oh, we've got our data protected by RAID 5, so we don't need to run SQL Server backups. That's ridiculous. And RAID's not a substitute for an effective HADR strategy to meet your RPO and RTO goals, no matter what anybody tells you. You know, some magic vendor appliance that you just bought, and they try to tell you you don't need to do backups anymore or have an HADR strategy. That, you know, don't fall for that. All RAID does is reduces the chance of unplanned downtime from losing one or more disks. And RAID 10 and RAID 50 are the most robust common RAID levels. RAID 5 is very brittle, especially as you have a bigger and bigger RAID 5 array. You have a higher chance of losing one of those disks in the RAID 5 array. All right, choosing storage type based on workload type. Flash storage gives you great random I.O. performance. The, the gap on sequential is not as big. Magnetic gives fair sequential, but terrible random performance. And so flash is absolutely the best choice if you have a budget and the costs have come down depending on what kind of flash we're talking about. So it's just about the same as magnetic storage was a few years ago. All right, HADR effects on storage. If you have traditional failover cluster instances, you have to have shared storage. But other than that, anything else you might be doing like availability groups or log shipping or replication, you can use any kind of storage you want. All right, configuring storage, data files, typically are still on magnetic, but I'm seeing more and more flash for that. Log files are usually on magnetic, but flash is also more popular, especially if you've got multiple, like I talked about earlier. TempDB, a lot of people just use flash whether they need it or not. It really depends on your workload. And if your workload hardly touches TempDB, you could use magnetic there and get away with it in many cases. All right, flash storage interfaces and protocols. The interface and the protocol that you're dealing with have a big effect on your flash performance. They're not all the same. And a lot of people just say, oh, I've got flash storage, but you need to know what kind of flash storage it is. So it can be a SATA or SAS interface. And with that, there's different generations there. So nowadays, most people have six gigabits per second for SATA or SAS, but newer systems have 12 gigabits per second, and it has an effect on how much sequential throughput you can do. And then most of the time, SATA and SAS are using the old AHCI protocol, which is developed for magnetic storage. And it only can have one command queue and 32 commands per queue. It doesn't do as well on flash storage. So where you want to be instead is on the PCIe Express interface. And then you want to be using the non-volatile memory express protocol, which is a more modern, lighter weight, better performing protocol than AHCI. It performs so much better, especially for SQL Server. All right, flash-based NAN types. You've got single-level cell, SLC, multi-level cell, MLC, and triple-level cell. And you even have other layers coming out. But Single level cell is the most expensive with the lowest latency and the highest endurance. And so you want that, but from a cost perspective, you might not be able to afford that. So you see more and more MLC and TLC, sometimes a little bit of SLC in front of it as a cache. And that's one reason 
and why flash storage has gotten much more affordable because you can get away with using MLC or TLC in some situations. Just be aware that it has an effect on your write performance and your endurance, especially. So new developments you want to be aware of for storage, Intel Optane, they finally have a product that uses this, that has, it doesn't use traditional NAND, it uses a different technology that has really good performance under low Q depths. And it's something you can use with storage spaces direct, or you can use it you know, in, in an internal card, for example. And then having the ability to use storage class memory, non-volatile DIMMs to cache the tail of the log is another very interesting thing you can take advantage with modern servers. All right, sizing your storage subsystem. You want to use a RAID calculator to make sure you've got more than enough disk space so you can take advantage of short stroking with magnetic storage, and just having lots of free space for flash storage. And then after you have space, make sure you have enough performance and don't negotiate with yourself. If you've done the analysis and you need flash, you need RAID 10, fight for it. Don't just give it away without a fight. And I try to get at least 10 to 20,000 IOPS or more on each LUN, and then at least one gigabyte per second or more of sequential throughput on each LUN on a modern system. And more is always better. Nobody's ever come to me and said, my database server's too fast, Glenn. I've never heard that. So fight the fight. So here's what it looks like, some comparative numbers from different systems I've tested over the years. So two 15K magnetic drives in RAID 1 is that top line, and that's pretty typical sequential performance for magnetic. And then as you add more, it goes up a little bit, but it's not that big of a jump. And then here's some consumer level SSDs in the middle, and then some older enterprise SSD flash cards, uh, add-in cards, at the bottom. You can kind of see there what's going on. What you might notice <clears throat> is that the very best consumer flash storage will perform better than enterprise storage, but you give up endurance and uh, consistency to get that better peak performance. And so don't, it's a big mistake to go out and buy consumer flash storage and use it for SQL Server workload. It may look good on the surface, but it's not going to have the same kind of endurance and it's not going to have power loss protection like enterprise storage does. And then here's the same numbers for random. And here's where you see the huge jump between magnetic on the top two rows and then consumer flash and then, you know, better enterprise flash as you go down. And, you know, these aren't even the most expensive card. These are all things that I actually had physical possession of. So, you know, this is all from Crystal Dismark, by the way. So, just a review, you've got five primary storage types. And depending what kind of topology you're using, you don't have to use shared storage. Many things you can use for HADR can get away with non-shared storage. And then be aware that the different types of SQL Server workloads are going to affect the I.O. patterns, which affects how you're going to set up and configure your storage subsystem. And the different file types also have different I.O. patterns. And then the RAID level is really important important for your workload for performance and for SLA reasons. And then finally, if you don't remember anything else from this, sequential throughput. It's super important for SQL Server. And so many times with enterprise storage, it doesn't do so well. So make sure you fight for that sequential throughput. So I've got a few references here. I've got some Pluralsight courses. I did a whole course on improving storage subsystem performance. And I have a couple of courses on how to scale SQL Server. So lots of little tips and tricks on how to make SQL Server perform better. And then Microsoft has two different programs right here that let you get a free three-month Pluralsight subscription. So you can do three months from one and three months from another one and watch Pluralsight for six months for free. And make sure you watch my courses if you do that. But seriously, Pluralsight's a pretty good resource to learn a lot of stuff about SQL Server. So that is that. So I've got some time for questions, if anybody has any. Sweet. We've got some good questions here. Um, for a brand new database server, how do you provide the I.O. requirements to the infrastructure team so that they can validate against it? Oh, that, that's tough. If it's a green field, nothing, you know, you're not replacing an existing system, that's going to be tough. And if I didn't have anything to measure that was currently in production, I think I would just 
use my rule of thumb of trying to get 10 to 20,000 IOPS and, and a gigabyte per second of sequential if at all possible, if I knew nothing else. Perfect. Um, another question here. Um, person works with AWS and storage is their primary bottleneck. <clears throat> what do you suggest that they do? You know, settings, architectures, configurations, things like that. Anything that they can improve to bump up the storage performance there? Well, that seems to be a common scenario with cloud uh, deployments. You go in there and measure with Crystal Disk Mark, and you get pretty pathetic numbers in a lot of cases. And so you need to do some research with whatever cloud provider you're dealing with and see what different kinds of storage they have available and then actually go in and do some testing. But even sometimes, like especially with, with Microsoft Azure, some of the stuff they list as premium is not that premium and you need to go in and do a little bit of tuning and get creative with how many different drives you have to get an acceptable level of sequential performance. Usually IOPS is not that bad but even with SSD storage that they advertise, sometimes the sequential is pretty bad, unfortunately. And that's, that's just an issue that they need to improve. Yeah, um, got another question here. Um, are there any suggestions on simulating a production workload on new hardware? And you know, my suggestion on that would be distributed replay. So it's not a simulation, it's an actual replay of your production workload on the new hardware. Do you have any other, uh, any other thoughts on that? Well, no, that's a good one. And then also Microsoft has a new tool called the Database Experimentation Assistant that uses distributed replay under the covers. And so you can capture a production workload and then replay it on a test system. And you can even replay it on a different version of SQL Server so you can see what would happen if you moved from SQL Server 2012 to 2017, for example, on your new hardware. It's a little tricky to set up and get running, but if you can get past that, I think that's a really useful tool. Cool. Another good question. Um, when using the cloud, does it make sense to use a 64K NTFS allocation unit? Well, if, if you have control of that, a lot of times that kind of stuff is abstracted away from you. But I think, you know, if, so if you're using a VM, infrastructure as a service, you might have control over that, but then you might not. It might, might just be that you, you request storage and you get what you get, and you have no control at that low level. Okay. If there's any other questions, now's the time to send it. Otherwise, we've just got a couple comments, just a lot of people thanking you for your diagnostic queries, and I'm one of them. I use them all the time. Well, thanks. I always like to hear that. I just came out with a new version for Azure SQL DB, which is going to be improving a lot in the next month or two. But it, it works now as it is. I just need to add more stuff to it. Nice. Um, got a couple things that just trickled in. Um, so a person has been upgrading the existing storage on a two-node cluster. Um, the index maintenance duration tripled. Uh, all of it's all SSD, Dell compellent. Um, what would be the first thing that you would look at there? Well, for index maintenance, you're reading the indexes, and, if you, and then you're writing them back out. So... I would be trying to see what's going on, whether it seems to be a problem reading or writing, and then what's going on with the system, or maybe running to some other bottleneck as you're doing that. And then you've got options to do things like with max stop and things of that nature that could affect it too with doing your index maintenance. So that's what I would be looking at. Yeah, the other thing that I would look at is do they have compression or data savings turned on the array? Um, there could be that. It yeah. could be, um, you know, just like you said, something with Q-depths. Um, I'd also, I'd want to sample Perfmon with whatever mechanism you've got to go look at the disk latencies during normal operations. If they're really high compared to before, there may be a problem in the interconnects before they even get to the SAN. Nope, that's good. Good advice. Cool. Uh, a couple requests to share the scripts. Yeah, I'll, I'll send them to you. I'll zip them up along with a PDF of the deck. Now you can do whatever you want, post it on the site or whatever. Perfect. Yeah, if you want to just send them over whenever you can, I'll get that and the recording posted here shortly. All right, great. Well, thanks for hosting. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for being on. Um, last question here. How do column store indexes, uh, how are they affected based on the storage? Well, I mean, column store has a very effective compression, and you know it's amazing what a difference you can do on a, a read. So if you've got a reporting kind of a workload, but 
I mean, so they take load off the storage because they're reading so much less data. And they also help relieve memory pressure compared to row store based indexes. But I don't, so I guess indirectly they affect the storage by taking some of the load off of it. Yeah, the other thing there, if the, uh, if the storage has got data savings turned on, you may want to make sure that the uh, the actual compression from the column store indexing may not be hurting the SAN any. Most of them can handle it just fine, but there are some vendors out there that shall remain nameless where if it's trying to compress something that's already greatly compressed, it may suffer a little bit. Yeah, no, that's true. Cool. Well, I think that'll do it. Excellent. Well, thanks All for right. coming on and speaking for us today. Yeah, no problem. Again, if you have any other questions, just send me an email. Perfect. Excellent. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Thanks, Glenn, for presenting. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all next month. All right. Thanks, David.